Hey, what's going on guys? This is chapter 19 of the CSCS study guide. We'll dive right in. This chapter is on program design and technique for speed and agility training. So um, let's define a couple terms first before we dive into the heavyweights um, for this chapter. Speed is skill needed to achieve high movement velocities, change direction. You need the change of direction skills to explosively change movement directions pretty straightforward there um, agility is what you need to change directions quickly right rate of force development it's the development of max force in the shortest amount of time as possible so you're trying to develop as much force in the shortest amount of time as possible all right impulse it's the product of generated force and time required for its production so a better way to explain that is this equation here. So you have the force right there, and then you have change time, right? So it's the product of force applied to an object and the amount of time that has been applied. Looking at speed versus velocity versus acceleration, speed is scalar, velocity is a vector. So there's a direction component um, to this measurement and then acceleration of course is the rate of change of the velocity right so um, maybe it's worth mentioning here meters per second meters per second squared all right so ground contact time is the length of time the athlete is in stance phase so how much time the athlete is spending on the ground is called ground contact time and then when he or she lifts off from the ground then ground contact time is over. So in max velocity, you're going to see asymmetrical production of the force and rate of force development is going to be very high during the ground contact time. Looking at the momentum here, we're looking at the relationship between mass of object and velocity of the movement. So you have mass here and velocity. So final velocity here and then initial velocity here. All right, so moving on to neurophysiological basis for speed. Strength training changes neural drive. It improves muscular force production by altering the motor neurons and how they react. Stretch shortening cycle. Um, you can see that the preparatory counter movements are part of the stretch shortening cycle and then the eccentric concentric coupling. So think of this as a squat jump, for example. You're really going into a deep squat, eccentrically loading those quads, and then boom, you're concentrically contracting those quad muscles and then coming up to a jump. So that's a good example of eccentric concentric coupling um, and occurs with muscle tendons rapidly lengthening, right? And then you can make this a complex training by adding in heavy resistance training. So when you're looking at post-activation potentiation. That's when heavy resistance training comes into play. You guys might have heard of this before. Um, we're looking for positive acute after effects with post-activation potentiation. So here's a good example um, in this picture here. You're going into a maximally loaded squat and then doing a couple reps there. And then the goal is to see some positive after effects after resting when you're going into a jump um, as you're loading, 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 and then you're coming back up. So looking at this graph here, we're comparing untrained individual, heavy resistance uh, trained individual and explosive ballistic trained individual. And let's look at 200 milliseconds. And you can see that the most amount of force is produced by explosive ballistic trained individual right at this spot. All right, moving right along, we're really going to break down sprinting, right? So with this, I like to start with early support phase, which is when your heel essentially uh, touches the ground, right? Continued concentric hip extension minimizes breaking effects of foot strike. And then there's a brief concentric knee flexion followed by eccentric hip extension. So there's a lot of words here. Um, I'm going to try to break this down for you um, more easily. So 
Think of the early support phase as, like I said, um, you're hitting the ground, and then late support, you're going more into uh, a hip extension, and then you'd start decelerating backward, right? And then your knee starts to extend a little bit, and then early flight is when your foot is off the ground, and then you're taking off. Mid flight is when your hip is flexing still, and you're accelerating forward. And then late flight is finally when the hip um, extends a little bit and it starts to come down to an early support phase. I know this can be a little confusing. I would look up a picture online. Um, it's very similar to our gait phases and how we walk. Um, so I think pictures would be better. I would have added it here if I had thought of it in time. And then you can come back here and then just go over how that picture relates to the descriptions here because I do think these descriptions um, can be helpful in figuring out what's eccentrically loading and what's concentrically uh, contracting and firing. So remember the early support, right, first, late support, and then early flight, mid flight, and late flight. We're gonna look at common sprinting technique errors um, here in the start and acceleration phase, okay? So if the hip is too high in start of the crouch position, that could be because of misunderstanding of the setup, right? The hip is too high, you're up too high. Athlete is stepping out laterally during the initial drive phase. That's improper distribution of forces. You're supposed to kind of collectively hone in on one spot so you can get the most out of that ground contact time and produce the most amount of force with greater rate of force development like we talked about earlier. Um, so if you're stepping out laterally, that's no bueno. Um, athlete's arm movement is abnormally short and tight. You're holding your arm by your side. You want to create that natural arm swing, right? so you can gain as much momentum as possible. Unnecessary tension in dorsal muscles, neck hyperextension, um, that could be because of the misunderstanding of the movement. And here are some of the coaching recommendations that you can take a look at um, also. Athlete jumps first stride or steps over the knee of the stance leg. So that could mean that the push-off angle is too high, right? It's because you're jumping off and we really want the athlete to initiate movement by driving through the ground, right? That's a very key uh, phrase that I've heard before working with um, sprint coaches. And this allows the swing leg to horizontally cut the stance leg um, rather than stepping over the stance leg. So another important thing to keep in mind there. Um, premature upright posture, you want to stay as low as possible in the beginning. And if you're upright too quick, too soon, that could mean that there's an inadequate push-off force, right? Moving on to the next slide here, um, we talked about the premature upright posture at maximum velocity, right? Um, this is not going to be the support phases. It's more likely going to be either early flight or mid flight here. In maximum velocity stage, if the athlete is superficially attempting to maintain an acceleration phase when the shins are clearly vertical, that could be because of, again, improper understanding of movement patterns. So you want to instruct the athlete that as the shins and hips come up to vertical as opposed to clearly vertical, so should the torso and head as well, okay? Encourage the athlete to feel for rising the hips so that the joints stay stacked or in line. If the athlete is not displaying optimal front side mechanics with regard to the height of swing leg, it could be because of the inadequate force production. So remember that the swing legs knee height is purely a display of ground reaction forces. So you're going to get off the ground as much as you drive into the ground, if that makes sense. Um, 
because of the ground reaction forces, right? So in order to adequately produce force, you need to be able to drive into the ground like we talked about earlier. Athlete is overstriding if they're striding um, in um, big leaps. That could be because of the misunderstanding of force application. Um, says success in sprint events results from the ability to produce high vertical forces in a short amount of time, right? Um, not horizontal forces. Athlete is displaying chronic hamstring injury or pain. This could be because of many different things, but insufficient mobility and proper positioning of the pelvis could cause um, nagging hamstring injuries or nagging hamstring pain because that's where the hamstring attaches to. Um, athlete is attempting to cycle the leg action resulting in an increased time to complete the swing phase. So they're basically, instead of striding um, more horizontally, they're cycling it, right? Taking more time. This is made apparent by the open gap between the knees during the stance phase. So it could be because of the improper force application. And last one, athlete is displaying erroneous, um, erroneous arm movements in the transverse plane. Um, and again, it goes back to understanding the right mechanics for the arm swing. And it's important to coach the athlete um, and to figure out whether this is a result of fatigue or uh, biomechanical inefficiency. All right, so moving on to agility development in athletes here. So it depends, it really depends on what we're trying to improve in these sprint athletes, right? If they're lacking in dynamic strength, then for beginner athletes, you can start with body weight exercises, um, making sure they're a little more aware of where their body is and trying leaning drills, right? Um, but then when it comes to some of the advanced athletes, you can do things like squats and pull variations in order to improve that dynamic strength. And dynamic strength is really important in sprint athletes because it is required to provide base strength, right? It's a good foundation for what's to come later. Now here's something very important, concentric explosive strength. Um, and it could, it says it could include isometric strength work. Um, you're looking to effectively reaccelerate after breaking phase um, and that, that stance phase of the foot, right? So doing things like box jumps where you're accelerating quickly or acceleration drills uh, for some of the more advanced athletes, you can try again box jumps, um, squat jumps, Olympic lifts, where you're trying to produce the most amount of force in the shortest amount of time. Eccentric strength is also very important, not only to prevent some of the injuries that happen um, with excessive loading of the tendon, but you also need to develop the ability to effectively absorb that loading um, required during the breaking phase of change of direction and agility. So doing things like drop landing to start with, where you're jumping off from an elevated surface into a squatting position, or deceleration drills um, where you're kind of leaning forward and then trying to decelerate better. For some of the more advanced athletes, um, you can still try drop landings um, and then receiving strength required during the catch phase of the Olympic lifts where you're having to control the descent with the weight on you is going to be very good, okay? And just to remind you, these are field and court drills, right? So this would be a little more dynamic um, and you would be doing these in uh, fields like this column here. And then the first and third column is mostly in the weight room. All right, reactive strength is also important to require, or it is required to increase the ability to transfer from high eccentric load 
to concentric explosiveness. So again, rate of force development, right? Trying to do that as quickly as possible. Plyometrics is literally the definition of how to increase reactive strength. Um, so everything here would be related to plyometrics. Multi-directional strength, you might assume that sprinting is only in this plane of motion, um, forward and backward, but that is not true because it is required to hold body position strongly during a multitude of movement demands. Our body moves in all planes of motion um, during sprinting. So doing things like low velocity, um, change of direction drills, right? Trying lateral, backward, and forward. And then for more advanced athletes, doing high velocity change direction drills, change of direction drills um, could come in handy there. Perceptual cognitive abilities that's required to progress in visual scanning, effective anticipation and decision making. Um, reaction drills would be um, the most foundational place to start. And then you can advance that to small sided games where you involve um, agility drills. All right, so sprint training, it really comes down to this. The goal is to improve eccentric strength and concentric explosiveness, right? And in training, you're trying to enhance perceptual cognitive ability, effective and rapid breaking of the momentum that you're carrying. And then after um, those effective breaking, you're trying to accelerate again towards new direction of travel, right? So there's two ways to take a look at this, change of direction and perceptual cognitive um, skill. Change of direction is a little more physical. You're keeping in mind that your trunk is going to be moving in all directions and that does influence performance and ability to decelerate. So focusing on the core of the body and knowing where your trunk is, is going to be crucial in learning and enhancing change of direction skills. Perceptual cognitive has more to do with agility. So visual scanning, anticipation, pattern recognition, um, increasing the reaction time and knowing uh, what situation you're in at the moment and getting that feedback as quickly as possible is going to be important in perceptual cognitive um, aspect of sprinting. So program design, this is pretty much the same thing for every chapter exercise interval exercise order frequency intensity recovery interval series volume work to rest ratio volume load you can take a look at these definitions and what i would do is go back to the examples that they give in the book and try to understand what exercise interval for example which is duration of the repetition um, is appropriate for the sprinter, right? Um, what kind of training in terms of the frequency, which is the number of training sessions performed in a given period of time, is appropriate for this sprinter based on their skill level. So I would use this as a framework when you examine different training schedules and different training regimen for sprinters in this chapter. Um, I hope that was helpful, guys. If you have any questions, please uh, comment on the comment section down below, and I'll see you in the next chapter. Thank you.